Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. David, thank you so much for joining me on Tuesday Talks. It's my absolute pleasure, Coco. Yeah, so we're talking to Dr. David Hamilton today. So you have a PhD in organic chemistry. So we come from a similar background. I'm a biochemist. <laughs> and you formerly worked uh, in the R&D department within the pharmaceutical industry, developing drugs for cardiovascular diseases and cancer. Which I always find it's quite funny. There's like a thread going throughout your life. You're also an author of 12 books, including the forthcoming, The Joy of Actually Giving a... Can we say it? Fuck. <laughs> I don't know, maybe YouTube will cancel us out, <laughs> which is actually the antithesis of a book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Um, and you're also the honorary scientific advisor for the charity 52 Lives, which helps people in need through acts of kindness. So the overriding theme today is going to be kindness, which I think is probably something we all need a lot of in our lives. So... Um, Tell us a little bit about your work in uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, I think you came to realize that also the placebo effect is very strong, just as strong as drugs. So kind of walk us through your, your career before you started um, about what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, so, uh, so I ended up working in, in cardiovascular medicine. And I always loved that, you know, that was always something that appealed to me, that, that and working on cancer as well. It's a sort of picture I had in my mind because I'd known of people who had who'd had heart disease and who, who'd had cancer so they, these were always the two things for me and so what I ended up in the pharmaceutical industry I was thrilled that my my all my projects were centered on on those two two areas but what fascinated me I think more than ever than anything was the placebo effects I remember in not so much in, in cancer but in the cardiovascular field I remember seeing the first results of drug trials of, of you know medicines that I'd been involved in and I was absolutely blown away by the fact that so many people had made some form of improvement on, on the placebo and I thought I need to understand this because I had a, a huge fascination with the mind-body connection my mom had had postnatal depression when I was a child and you know and we'd got my mom and I had got into thinking about the power of the mind and stuff for years. So I had this fascination. So the moment I saw these really impressive stats, I, I needed, I wanted to understand it because at that time no one really understood it. I remember my colleagues just dismissed it. It's just the placebo effect, as if it's like sweeping something off the table. It's irrelevant. And so I, I it's because they didn't, they didn't understand it. What is the placebo? Let's take a step back. What is the placebo effect for someone that perhaps doesn't understand what that is? Right. So, so it's when someone makes a positive improvement when instead of taking a medicine, an actual drug, they've actually taken a sugar tablet or, or some other thing that's got no uh, medical benefit whatsoever. So sometimes it's just secretly swapped for a placebo or sometimes they're just given something that they think is a real drug. But, but what's amazing is for many people in many medical conditions, it actually makes a positive improvement. But here's the here's what I found was really fascinating when I started researching and looking into it was when you let, let's use pain for an example. Let's say someone has a headache pain or they have maybe a pain in their hip or, or their, their knee or something, and they take what they think is a painkiller, but it's actually a sugar tablet. You'll find that most of the time, and when I say most of the time, maybe around 70% of the times, okay. the pain will, will diminish or go away completely depending on, on what it's for. But it's not just a figment of your imagination. The expectation that follows me taking this pill. So I take a pill, I expect something out of it, don't I? I, I take someone gives me a painkiller, I'm expecting something to happen. And so that expectation actually causes your brain to produce its own natural painkillers. So your brain is like a pharmacy and it has its own natural versions of a number of different things that we take when we open a, a bottle of pills. And, and so what it does, it produces a natural painkiller that then 
targets the area of the body that's in pain. And so when the pain goes away, let's say 70% of the time, it's not just because it's a figment of your imagination, it's actually a real physical effect, like a real chemical change in your brain that's triggered by you expecting something to happen. Fascinating, hey? The body, is, the body and the mind connection is just so fascinating. Um, let's, let's move back into your childhood a little bit and talk about your mother and her postnatal depression and how she eventually kind of came out of that. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is actually, you know, what got me interested in the placebo effect in the first place. My mum, after I, I've got three sisters and my youngest sister was born in the mid-70s, and my mum developed postnatal depression. Now, back in the mid-70s, Coco, it wasn't very well understood. Not the way postnatal depression is understood today, but, you know, we, we're talking about what, 40 years ago or so, and it wasn't very well understood at that time. My mum didn't get the right treatment. In fact, one of the doctors she saw actually said to her, you just need to give yourself a shake. I mean, asking a woman with postnatal depression to give yourself a shake that's like asking someone with a broken hip to just run it off and it'll be fine. Yeah. You know, so, so my mum developed a lot of challenges with anxiety and not only depression, but anxiety that came off of this and, and self-esteem that came off of feeling like I'm just not a good mum. Maybe I'm just not a strong person, all the, these kind of things. And, and during that time, my mum tried to protect myself and my sisters from this, like like all parents do. She didn't want us to you know, to know that she was unwell. So she did her best to protect us, but you could tell sometimes. And that was, for me, that nurtured empathy because I, I had this empathy for my mum. And empathy is this, in all my work in kindness, empathy is the starting point of kindness. And so what that did, it nurtured for me empathy, which built in me this wish to help my mum. And I remember one day, this might sound a bit corny, a bit woo-woo to some people, but I had just started high school. I was, I was 11 years old and the English teacher took us to the school library. And I'd never been in a library before, as far as I can remember. And a book fell off the shelf. Right. And when I say fell off the shelf, perhaps I knocked it with my bag. I don't remember. But it fell off the shelf and it landed face up. And it was called The Magic Power of Your Mind. And it was by an author called Walter Germain. And I had this overriding instinct that I bet that can help my mum. And I want to help my mum. So I just put it in my bag and took it. I didn't know that you're supposed to join a library. <laughs> okay. <laughs> People, join libraries. Don't just take books. <laughs> never, I'd never been in a library. So I took it. And, you know, it really helped my mum. We still have the book, by the way. Shh. But yeah. it, it, well, it didn't say you've got to return it at some yeah. Some particular time. <laughs> so uh, so it, it really helped my mum. It didn't cure her of depression but what it, in a day. But what it did do is it taught her tools and insights and strategies that helped her to navigate a course through some of the more difficult days. You know, like things like what we now call mindfulness meditation. Back then, my mum just called it relaxation. Right. Things like positive affirmations. So because it was so helpful to my mum, this learning these mind tools, that's why mom, I, I developed this fascination with the power of the mind. Because all through my teenage years then, my mum and I would talk about the power of the mind because it was so helpful to her. We talked about the power of the mind. We had these fascinating conversations. So wind the clock forward, you can understand why, when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, why my interest was the placebo effect, the power of the mind, more so than the medicines that I was helping to build. It's because I had so much base experience and interest in the mind-body connection. So what exactly was it that helped your mother in the end? Like, let's talk about visual visualization for a second. Yeah, it, it was a couple of things. It, first of all, it was positive affirmations. I remember my mum saying, I can do it. I can do it. It, it. Mind over matter. It's the thought that counts and all these pumping our fist, these kind of things. And, and the relaxation work, but also visualization practices, you know, like visualizing yourself feeling better, felt, you know, filled with light, all these kind of things. And one of the reasons that visualization can be powerful is in many ways, your brain doesn't really make a distinction between whether you're really doing something or whether you're imagining. 
the thing. To your brain, it's often processed the same. For example, there's a seminal study that was done at Harvard by a neurologist called Alvaro Pascal Leon, where he compared people playing a sequence of notes over five days on a piano with their hand, with the fingers, with people uh, doing the same thing without making any finger movements, but imagining it. So one group for over the five days for a period of time each day played the notes with their fingers. The other group played the notes with their mind, but they had to imagine that they were playing using their fingers. And amazingly, when he scanned the brain every day, the, there were significant changes in the brain in both groups. It didn't matter whether you played the notes with your fingers or whether you played the notes in your imagination. To the brain, the brain literally changes to change to the same degree and in the same way. They did the same with they did the same with athletes. They had one half workout in the gym, and the other half had to imagine the same workout without going to the gym. And the percentage of body muscle and fat was actually even better, improved in the placebo, let's say, uh, group than the actual people that went to the gym. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. In fact, yeah. athletes, almost all elite athletes use visualization in some capacity yeah. to improve their performance. And what they also use it is for is for speeding up recovery. I mean, what one research, group of researchers uh, to test the, the one concern from athletes is if they're injured, they're yeah. concerned about the loss in muscle strength. Right. So researchers immobilized uh, the wrist area from here from here all the way down to the elbow to completely immobilize the wrist. And they calculated over a month by testing people's strength, how much strength they lost. And the average loss in strength was 42%. Uh, and then they got another group, they completely immobilized the wrist. But this time they asked them to do two sets of 25 mental reps where they had to imagine pushing their hand against the side of the cast, even though that wasn't possible because it was complete immobilization. That was the key, complete immobilization. But they had to visualize two sets of 25 reps going like that. Imagine that they could break down the walls of the cast, you know, push it like that. And amazingly, they lost half the amount of strength. In other words, somehow just visualizing had dramatically by half, by almost 50%, slowed down the rate of loss of muscle strength, even in someone who, who's injured, technically. Nice. I need to do that to my Achilles heel. <laughs> I guess we could talk about the power of manifestation here as well, right? So it's visualization of things that should already be in place. Yeah, yeah. I, I sometimes think of this, Coco, as like the world in some respect seems to mirror the same laws that are caught inside the body. Uh, you know, when I say laws that occur inside the body, that that your brain doesn't distinguish real from imaginary. And if you keep continually visualizing things within reason, then that begins to, through the interconnectedness of the body, inside the body, that the body begins to move in the direction of what you're imagining is true. And I think sometimes in the outside world, it's like the outside world is a, is a projection or, or a fractal, if you will, of, of the inside because what we often see as you repetitively imagine something is true in the outside world is, again, through the interconnectedness of things, we begin, we find that our life begins to move in that direction, or things, people and things begin to come towards us, almost as if the outside world isn't distinguishing between real and imaginary. So what we continue to hold to be true and imagine to be true in our minds, just like it changes what's happening in the body, it seems to alter what happens in our life as well. It seems to be the same rule, but just yeah. operating in a different t context. Yeah, let's not go too far down that route, but yeah, it's true. <laughs> so you used to research drugs for the heart, and now your mantra is, if you live from the heart, it's good for the heart. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, one of the the first drugs I ever worked on was a drug, an antihypertensive drug. And basically that what that means is a drug that helps to reduce blood pressure. And it was modeled upon many, many antihypertensives, not all, but many antihypertensives are modeled on one of nature's natural processes. Because one of the natural ways that your own body moderates and, and works against even our unhealthy lifestyle changes, one of the ways your body works against that naturally is through the production of a little substance called nitric oxide. So your body produces nitric oxide. You also get it in foods, certain foods that you eat as well. Uh, 
and what nitric oxide does is, is it, it, it connects, it binds to the lining of your blood vessels. And, and that, releases a te- that releases some of the tension on the walls of the blood vessels, which causes the blood vessels to expand. And as they expand, your heart doesn't have to work as hard to get the blood through. So what we get is a reduction in blood pressure. So say so these antihypertensives like nitric oxide is a cardioprotective substance. And so for me working on that field, I thought was fascinating because just the ability to be able to change the shape of the blood vessel. But what got me interested in the subject of kindness was realizing that when you have an experience of kindness, now whether you're the giver of the kindness, the receiver of the kindness, or even the witness to the kindness, because of how that feels for you, we generate what I call kindness hormones in the body. I call them kindness hormones because they're produced just like stress hormones, but they go in the opposite direction, right? So I call them kindness hormones for that reason. And one of the most amazing things they do is they also park, they bind to the lining of the blood vessels, but they generate nitric oxide. That process generates nitric oxide, eh, which then causes reduction in tension in the walls of the blood vessels, reduces blood pressure because the heart doesn't have to work as hard. So what kindness does is it seems to complement or tap into a very natural process. And that's one of the triggers for me that got me interested in the entire field of research and kindness, because it really taps into uh, the one of nature's most natural uh, processes. So that's where, where I, I started that mantra for myself is if you live from the heart, it's good for the heart. Because if you live from the heart, it means that you're, you're, you're feeling empathy for people's pain and you're doing what you can to help and you're, you're being kind. And that experience is therefore causing this change in blood pressure. Interesting. What is oxytocin? So oxytocin is, a, is the main kindness hormone. So obviously many people will be familiar with oxytocin because it's a reproductive hormone and and it's also a bonding hormone. These are the bits that we've known about for decades. But oxytocin is also a very, very potent cardiovascular hormone. And that's a bit that very few people know. In fact, the first uh, identification of this was when researchers were wondering why it was that women, when they're breastfeeding, tend to have lower blood pressure than average. Yeah. And so researchers, rather than just assuming it's something to do with maybe you're relaxing, it, that, of course, but the, the the breastfeeding was causing the production of oxytocin. And when they studied it, they realized that oxytocin was binding to our blood vessel walls, producing nitric oxide and reducing the blood pressure. So that catalyzed the, the discovery and the understanding of oxytocin, as well as being a reproductive hormone and a bonding hormone, also a hugely important cardiovascular uh, hormone. Uh, but as I say, it's also a kindness hormone because research now shows also that oxytocin is produced, i.e. our kindness hormones produced through experiences of kindness, whether you're the giver of the kindness, helping someone, whether you're the receiver of it, or whether you're even just feeling moved because you're witnessing it either live or even by watching a film or watching a clip on social media, for example. Hmm, interesting. Can we give too much kindness? And are we then stressed if we don't receive it? Oh, I'm, gl- oh, I'm glad you point. Yeah, I, yeah. I, <laughs> I tell you, you probably thought quite it hard about this. Because yeah, that, 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 that is exactly true, uh, Coco. Uh, it's very true. In fact, researchers actually, I don't even need to quote research because I think people are familiar with this themselves. But if I did quote research, research does show that kindness is only good for us up until a point, until it becomes tiresome, until it becomes you're taking advantage, you feel like you're taking advantage of, or you feel like you're doing too much without any gratitude. And there's a line, a point that's different for each person because it depends where you are in life and it depends how long this has been been happening. You know, it could if you've been taken for granted for a long time, for example, taking advantage of not being shown gratitude for a long time, then that point is a lot lower. And and so over that particular point, that line, then helping others can actually be counterproductive because what we what actually does is it causes us stress and it damages our mental health. And what you then need to do is flip the script and recognize that I need to be kind to myself. I have to look after my own needs. And, and I think where that line is, it, it, it's not in the same place for everyone because it really does depend where you are in your life. Sometimes, you know, our cup feels 
full and overflowing. And then you've got lots of energy and time to help other people. But sometimes, depending on what's happening in your what's happened in the past or what's happening right now, it feels like our cup is almost empty. And if we try to help other people from an empty cup, they say that you can't pour from an empty cup. If our cup of what we have, our energy, is almost empty, then it's futile trying to help other people because we run out of energy and it can sometimes come across in the wrong way. What we have to do now is immediately recognise the need for self-kindness and top up our own cup first. I was going to say, everyone is critical. Yeah, everyone's critical to themselves most, I think. So I think we need to start by being kind to ourselves and then perhaps our cup can be fuller and we can share that kindness. Absolutely, yeah. Have to top up our own cup. And you mentioned, you know, criticism, self-criticism is a is a big one for a lot of people. One of the things I often, an exercise I often suggest to people is to write a self-compassion letter oh, wow. as an antidote. Yeah, as an antidote to self-criticism. Because self-criticism and self-compassion are, are opposite. Self-compassion is an antidote to, to self-criticism. And self-compassion is just recognising, yeah. uh, you know, if you were... If you were talking to a friend who was having a hard time, who was criticizing themselves, feeling down about the way things went or the way they behaved, then you would show compassion for them. So com self-compassion is extending that to yourself. So something just writing a compassion letter. Yeah, or a gratitude <laughs> diary, perhaps. A gratitude like a diary, that's quite nice. Something, something very similar. And just writing it from that set, imagining that you're you're writing it from that deepest, wisest, most compassionate part of yourself. But imagine it's been written by by someone else, a, a caring friend. What would they say to you? you? They would show empathy. They would show understanding. They would show kindness and support before they try to offer any advice. Yeah, that's true. So I think, yeah, it's, hard, it's sometimes hard to be kind to yourself. I definitely have to remind myself of that. Um, what about, so... Obviously, my book is also about splitting up from, you know, the father of my kids and so forth. And given that the divorce rate is 50 plus percent, whatever. How do we kind of in those moments when we're feeling maybe angry with ourselves and our ex-partner and life in general, how do we bring that in and share a little bit of kindness towards ourselves and to the whole situation that's just the right, uh, that's just happened? Sure. You know, one of the, one of the techniques I have practiced in my life and I often recommend to people is a, a little pra a little mindfulness based practice called kindfulness, mm, and it's a, it's a friendly spin on mindfulness. You know, mindfulness for 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 your know, listeners who haven't you know tried mindfulness. It's basically just being mindful of the fact that you're breathing. So you breathe and you bring your attention to that. And what you see in the brain is is resources move from stress centers of the brain to frontal parts of the brain. And that begins to build up this part of the brain like you're working out a muscle. And that's why mindfulness can be so beneficial because it, it helps us to better manage how we're feeling, helps us to better manage our state. But instead, if as part of your mindfulness focus, you switch a little bit of the focus rather than just the breath, you just think, Put a little bit of the focus onto thinking kindly. It could be thinking kindly of someone in your life, someone you care about, and thinking of maybe how nice a person that person is. Or you might be recalling acts of kindness, or even you might be saying a series of, of phrases, but one of which I'll share in a second. And what that does is that works out this part of the brain, but there's a slight bias to the left-hand side and a wee bit deeper. Crucially, these are areas of the brain associated with happiness and joy, positive mood and it doesn't mean that if you do this practice you'll instantly be happy and always be happy but what it does mean is that part of the brain begins to work grow like a muscle and just like a muscle when it grows becomes stronger what that means is as that part of the brain works out it be, it means that happiness joy positive mood these states become more accessible to you so against the back drop of what's happening it just makes it a little bit easier because that muscle is stronger to access these kind of states now a classic kindfulness practice is a buddhist practice called metta m-e-t-t-a or, or loving kindness and, and basically you say you start with yourself and this is why it's so good for self-kindness because you start with yourself and you say may i be happy and well and safe and may i feel at ease and you say that three times and then you extend that sentiment onto other people, particularly people you love, people close to you. 
And then if you feel like it after a few attempts, you can even extend it to the pe person and the people who are giving you a lot of stress in your life at the time. When you also say, may you be happy and well and safe, may you feel ease. And what research studies do show is because we're starting with ourselves and we're building up the sentiment of wishing kindness and compassion, it becomes easier to change a wee bit of a perception of what we're thinking of another person, not to let them off the hook for stress they're causing us, but really to help ourselves to release a bit more of the tension and the stress we're carrying. So in a sense, it's an act of self-kindness. Really. So could we, could we say that if we're stressed, we're building that muscle up versus if we're trying to be kinder and we're building that muscle up in our head. Yeah, well, uh, interestingly, kindness is physiologically the opposite of stress, the exact opposite. I often ask people what is in, in lectures that I give, what do you think is the opposite of stress? And everyone says peace and calm. Yeah. Peace and calm are not the opposite of stress. They're the absence of stress. Okay. Neurologically and physiologically, the opposite of stress is kindness. In fact, if I put this another way, because stress is a feeling, kindness is a thing that you do. So let me rephrase it. The opposite of the experience of stress and what that experience is like mm. is the experience of kindness and what that is like. And if you chart all of the physiological effects of stress and the physiological effects of kindness, you'll find that they go literally in the opposite direction. It's like a seesaw. But what researchers have actually found is as kindness increases from the neurological level, the cellular level, to the cardiovascular level, the immune system, it literally goes in the opposite direction. As kindness goes up, all of the physiological parameters of stress begin to come down and it's opposite. When stress goes up, the kindness stuff tends to come down. So they, they don't exist together. So if you start thinking kindly, being kind, even if it starts with yourself, then it does actually have an antidotal effect, a neutralizing effect on, on stress. So when we're stressed, we should practice an act of kindness. And it's not just, like, you know, you know, wishful thinking. It's not just thinking, oh, but the stress isn't really going away. Neurologically, we produce, we act, Kindness hormones actually bind to the right. primary stress center in the brain and they turn it down like a dimmer switch. Literally, you actually see an MRI scans, they actually bind to, they connect onto the primary stress center. And just like you'd turn a dimmer switch down, if a volume is too, if a, a room is too bright or a volume control is too high, you turn the switch dial down. Kindness hormones literally dial down the intensity of the primary stress center of the brain. So, David, let's talk about your ninth book a little bit called I Love Me. And uh, that was a book about self-esteem. So you were quite confidently writing that book. Um, and then your agent told you something different. So what happened? Yeah, so I, 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 I'd always avoided the subject of self-esteem because I, I never real I, I didn't realize I had a problem myself right. i didn't realize i was low on it it's because you know it's because there's two types of self-esteem there's internal and there's, there's external and people often confuse them like external self-esteem is when we <clears throat> when we build uh, we have we feel a lot of our sense of worthiness and value from external things you know so our successes in life our achievements in life if people like us so we we, we get a, a sense of our own worthiness from things on the outside but that's not healthy because all it needs is something to change in the outside and it's devastating but it's internal self and that's what i had the external stuff right. internal self-esteem is when we have an inner sense of worthiness and value you know which is really what self-love is if you include self-compassion into that <clears throat> that description and <clears throat> i i remember one time at the side of the stage before i spoke after one of my favorite heroes, speakers, a guy called Dr. Wayne Dyer, who passed away a few years ago. I was the next speaker after him at an international confident, uh, con concert, uh, conference. And I, I, all, I, I took a panic attack. And it wasn't to do with being nervous on stage at all, because I'd spoken to the audiences like that before. It was because I felt really small and insignificant. Like, how could I possibly be on stage alongside these other people, half of the other conference speakers to be in an opera. And I thought, well, how can I do anything like that? You know, I'm just imposter a small syndrome. person. Yeah. And I just felt, it was imposter syndrome and I just felt so small. And, and I I felt like literally I, I was panicking. And if it wasn't for the fact that my, my publisher literally 
pushed me on stage. I, I felt I just wanted to go home and cry. Is how I was felt. And I realized then that was a repeating pattern in my life and I had to work on self-love. So I said to my publisher, right, my next book is called, I want to call it I Heart Me. This, you know, I want to work on, on self-love and really go to town on this. And, and I, I said to them, and I want to do it right now. And, and we, we arranged a deadline in six months. And, and I wrote the book, just blasted through it, so motivated. And, and I remember I submitted it and the managing director of my publisher, Hay House, a, woman, a lady called Michelle Pilly, asked if she could have a meeting, a chat with me. And we met in a coffee shop and she said, you know, we, we love you in the office but I can't accept this book as it is. She said, if we publish it in its current form, it will be damaging to your career. Wow. <laughs> wow. Some of the best feedback I've ever had from a book yeah. in my life, because she, she was absolutely right. And the thing is, the problem is, Coco, I had written the book in my from my head. I'd written it by quoting scientific research. I'd written it by, you know, finding strategies and saying, do this, do this. I hadn't actually shifted myself. I still hadn't learned any self-love. I'd written the book in my head intellectually. Right. And the changing point was when Michelle said to me, okay, no deadline, no pressure. Because what I'd been trying to do, <clears throat> Coco, I'd been trying to, by setting myself a deadline, yeah. which was, uh, it was actually the 30th of June, that particular year. And, and by setting myself that deadline, what I was essentially saying is, I will love myself by the 30th of June. And that doesn't really work by putting a deadline. I'm going to love myself by next week. You know, you, you know, you, first of all, you've got to be compassionate to yourself and let yourself find your own way in your own time kind of thing. So Michelle said, right, no deadline. Take as long as you want. I don't care if it takes you years. Just come back to this book when you feel ready and contact me Again, when you feel you're making progress and we could look at when we would publish. And see the moment the pressure was off. And I, I then started to find self-love. I call it the acceptance paradox. You know, the moment you, I, I had to accept mm -hmm. that I had worked on this book for six months and learned nothing. But I think it's very interesting. I think it's interesting that you pointed out that you're going to be kind to yourself and love yourself when you achieve X. Right? Yeah. And I think a lot of people do that or we we all do it to some extent versus just even if that doesn't happen so I quite love the concept there's no such thing as failure even if you've kind of failed you can still love yourself like everyone fails and you know failure is just maybe a step to move forward or in a different direction so that's a really good point that you made yeah I, I think of it as the acceptance paradox the moment you act whatever you accept spontaneously yeah. changes and the moment you accept yourself, you'll begin to grow. Yeah. But as long as you're saying, like you said, you pointed out there, Coco, that I will love myself when I get to that thing, when I achieve that thing over there, then you're not really accepting yourself. So you can't, you're not growing. Growth comes from the point of self-acceptance. So the moment I accepted that I hadn't learned anything in six months, I actually had a break. I remember breaking down crying in front of Michelle because I, I realized I was under so much stress and pressure to love myself because that was <laughs> the goal of writing the book. You know, I put myself under all this, you know, abnormal amounts of strain to love myself. And I was doing the opposite. And so, so the, the release for me was accepting myself that I had gained nothing, that I didn't love myself. I hadn't learned anything at all, despite the fact I'd put six months of research into this book and written 50,000 words. I had learned nothing. But the moment I accepted that, I began to grow. And that's when I started the book started coming together and it took me another couple of years to write it because I had to learn how to love myself. You can't write a self-love book unless you know what you're talking about. And it took me two years, if I'm being really honest, to, to learn and grow enough that I could then speak from a little bit of experience. And that's why to this day, that's still one of the books I'm most proud of because that period of change within me was more than I'd grown in 15 years previously working on personal development. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. We really appreciate it. Because <laughs> I think the point of this show is to show that no one is alone. Everyone is going through similar struggles or sim similar situations in life. And so it's just great to hear that everyone has these kind of breakdown moments or realization moments. And then, you know, we need to fix ourselves and do something different. So that's really good. Um, we're all slowly aging. 
And um, your philosophy is that kindness is better than Botox. <laughs> Walk us through that. <laughs> Partly this is because I, I, I pointed out earlier that kindness is physiologically the opposite of stress. Mm -hmm. So if stress is one of the, the most known and understood accelerators of aging, then of course, kindness should have the opposite effect. What's interesting is scientists have began to understand exactly why that is. And it turns out that inside our skin, we actually produce kindness hormones that have an antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory effect. And you know, to give you a, the Botox comparison study, researchers took skin cells and they put them under stress in a way that was meant to simulate the conditions inside our skin when we're under chronic stress, whether that's chronic mental and emotional stress or whether that's chronic lifestyle stress from other lifestyle habits. But they, they produced the same, they simulated a similar set of, of conditions. And what they observed primarily was high levels of, of what are called free radicals you know, or, or uh, technically it's, it's referred to as oxidative stress. It's the chemical version of men mental and emotional stress. But most people know about them as free radicals and free radicals cause lots of havoc. Like they, they, they cause damage to our blood vessels, they cause damage to the brain. They're implicated in dementia because of the damage they cause in, in the brain. They're implicated in heart disease, cardiovascular diseases because of the damage they do. But they also cause a lot of damage to our skin and they accelerate aging within skin. So researchers did the same experiment again, but this time in the presence of high levels of our kindness hormones. And amazingly, the levels of free radicals dropped through the floor. There was a massive and significant drop in free radicals, this oxidative stress inside skin cells when the skin cells had the presence of kindness hormones. Now you can't eat or drink kindness hormones, you can't put them in a face product, you have to produce them. And one of the key ways to produce them is through experiences of kindness, whether the giver, the receiver, or the witness to the kindness. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say kindness is better than Botox. It's a <laughs> way of saying, you know, we can slow down aging of skin by tapping into this opposite of stress effect. And the opposite of stress is kindness. I love that. I think it's a really good message. Yeah. Um, what is paying it forward? And do you have any examples of this? All right. Okay. So if someone does something kind for you, mm -hmm. it, you know, the instinct to say, oh, let, let me, you, you want to pay it back, don't you? You want to do something for them to reciprocate. It's part of what, what makes us human. But pay it forward to saying, okay, I will take, thank you for that. And in the spirit with which you've helped me and I feel better now, I'm going to do something for someone else. So I will, instead of paying it back, I will pay it forward in, instead. So uh, if I could share even a... Uh, in fact, I'll give you a, a personal example. I remember you can. This can happen even if you're witnessing something. I remember just sitting in a coffee shop and I saw someone walking past a a, a, a young girl walking past a person who was homeless, and he was sitting in a little sign. And I I happened to be notice this in a coffee shop. And the girl walked past. She stopped for a second, then she walked on. I didn't pay much attention. I just noticed a minute later she came back with some food and a coffee. And she gave it to them, gave it to the guy, and they, they exchanged something, talked for a minute, and then, then she walked away. And that had a really big effect on me. Remember I said kindness, whether you're a giver, receiver, or a witness to it. Because I felt quite moved by that, mm. over the course of the rest of the day, I found myself being kinder to other people. Oh, interesting. As a consequence, I was getting on the train. I was buying my ticket at the train station because, you know, I'd forgotten how to do it. I didn't know how to do it on my phone at the time. Uh, I'm a late starter with these kind of things. I was buying my ticket and I first found myself, you know, I, I, I'm always kind and pleasant, but I just found myself being kind of a wee bit more mm. so and, and making an extra effort over the course of the day. And, and what that is, is you're moved by someone's act of kindness, whether you do it yourself or whether you're the receiver or the witness to it, and you then do it for someone else. In fact, let me share you a cool bit of research, if, if, if you don't mind. So researchers measured the pay it forward effect. And it turns out that kindness actually pays it forward. It ripples out to what's called three degrees of separation. 
And the R number for this, you know, kindness is contagious in this respect. And the R number is one of the highest R numbers I've ever come across in science. It's somewhere between three and five. You know, we all know the R number from COVID days, you know, it means the reproducibility number or the reproducibility rate. The higher the number means the more contagious something is. If it has an R number of one, it means that it's just going to stay flat. It's not going to grow or, or get any worse kind of thing. The R number of kindness is somewhere between three and five. And it, I say somewhere between because it depends on the context. It depends on where you are, how many people you interact with. But as a ballpark average. So let's suppose we take five just to make the point. So what researchers found at Harvard and Yale is if you be kind to someone, because of how you make that person feel, remember the person will feel either gratitude or relief maybe, or even just a connection with you. Because of how that person now feels, that person will then, over the course of the next day, will probably be kind or kinder mm. to, five, to, so to five people as a consequence of how you made them feel. That's what the R number of five means. They will be kind or kinder to five people because of how you made them feel. But now those five people are at one degree of separation from you, meaning they're one social step away from you, one step separate from you. But if you had a wee drone and you were flying that drone about to track all of these five people, not that you would do that, but if you did, yeah. then what you would probably find is over the course of the next day, all of those five people would also be kind or kinder to five people. So what you now have is 25 people who are at two social steps away from you. If you had a swarm of drones and you tracked those 25 people, again, not that you would do it, but if you had the technology and you felt like it uh, and you didn't think there was any ethics involved in that, then you could track these 25 people and all their actions. What you would then find on average is each of those 25 people would probably be kind or kinder to yeah. five people. And what you would then find at three degrees of separation from you, three social stages away from you, 125 people are benefiting from an act of kindness. Uh, and it's like you do kind, you do something kind for one person. And most of us do this every day. And then you go away and get on with the rest of your day, like that young girl did with, when she bought some food and coffee for the homeless person. You walk away and get on with the rest of your day. What you don't see yeah. is what happens next. And what happens next is the ripple effect. And I just wanted to point that out because I think a lot of us in our lives, and I, me included, even as an author of these kind of stuff, we're, we're, all, we're all human, is we all have these moments where you wonder, what's the point of me? What's the point of what I do? And you know, am I really having an effect? Am I really helping people? Am I really, you know, do I make a contribution to society? And I'm point, I want to say that yes, you do. And even the seemingly small things that each and every one of us does, all of those things that we just take for granted because they're just we're just being ourselves. You walk away and go on with the rest of your day, but what you don't see is there's always a ripple effect. There's always a ripple effect. You're always benefiting a lot of people on the other end of it. It's like if you drop a pebble in a pond and it goes plop, mm -hmm. creates a wee, a wee plop, and then there's a wee wave, and the wee wave moves out, and you walk away, and you're halfway down the road, you're away down, down the road, and what you don't see is a minute or so later, there's lily pads rising and falling. <laughs> And now they don't know why they're rising and falling, but they're doing that because of the wave that you no longer notice because you've walked away. But they're rising and falling because of the wave, but the wave was created by the pebble you dropped. And that's the pebble is a metaphor for you dropping a wee bit of kindness into the world. And the wave is a real wave. And the, the, it's not lily pads rising and falling. It's people's hopes and their, their days and their smiles and, and their sense of that was nice. It's a positive mood that are rising simply because of something that you seemingly insignificant and small did, and then you walked away down the street and got on with the rest of your day. But that ripple effect is always happening, and it's a pay-it-forward type mechanism. People feel good. They feel uplifted, elevated, and they pay it forward. They naturally feel inclined to pass this good feeling, to share it with someone else by helping another person. That's a great analogy. So we would say there are a lot of benefits of giving a, you know, fuck. <laughs> um, and also sometimes we shouldn't at, at the same time. So um, how do we balance that when we should, when we shouldn't? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. I, I, it's a wee bit 
I, I sort of touched on this earlier. I, I think there's a sweet spot, again, that I talked about earlier, like a balance. And at one end of the scale, your cup feels overflowed. And you've got lots of energy, time, resources, and you feel I can help people, blah, blah, blah. And you don't really feel you need to fill your own cup. You don't need to recharge. Yeah. But sometimes down here, the other end of the scale, you're, you're running on empty and you've got to recharge. You've got to fill up your own cup so that there's more of you available with which to, to help other people. And then there's all these points in between. And there's a, I call this a sweet spot because it's in a different place for each of us. You know, sometimes it's up here, sometimes it's down there. And it depends on what's happening in your life. It depends on what's going on before this point in your life. But we should be able to give ourselves permission, right? We should be able to give ourselves permission to sometimes say, I can't do this. Yeah. And then sometimes you know, your cup is overfilling. So I think sometimes we get stuck in the thought that we should always be kind and always do stuff for other people. Yeah, and, and I think, Coco, this this comes from something that we learn uh, in, our, in our culture because in many cultures, uh, there's a big thing made about the importance of self-sacrifice and the importance yeah. of helping other people. It, it's taught in many, many religious, spiritual traditions about being kind and helping other people. And so because that's given such a high esteem yeah what we're not taught is yes that's important but you can't pour from an empty cup you've also got to keep yourself charged up and that bit is just excluded or, yeah. or forgotten about in the teachings so deep down we've got this guilty feeling when we help when we try to do something for ourselves we get this guilty feeling because it's ingrained in our in subconscious, it's ingrained in the human psyche that, wait a minute, I'm being selfish here because I'm supposed to be good to other people. But it's only because in our culture we've forgotten to point out, absolutely do these things, but at the same time, recognise when you also have to recharge, when you also have to top up your own cup, when you recognise that you also got to include yourself in this equation, Otherwise, we end up burning ourselves out. We end up, it becomes a point, if someone's taking advantage or not showing any gratitude, it becomes stressful. Or even just somebody's caring too much can be just so yeah. incredibly stressful. So we've got to, we need to also learn to get rid of that programming that we've learned. We've got to also learn that you've got to include yourself. And even just knowing that, I think that, there, that we should do that. I think knowing that makes you realize where in your life you need to find that kind of balance point when you need to top up your own cup. And sometimes it's as simple as just sometimes setting some boundaries. Other yeah. times it could be saying no. It doesn't have to be a hard no, like an in-your-face no. It can be a, a gentle no, a respectful no. It says, look, not right now, maybe some other time. It doesn't have to be a hard thing. It can be, it can be you know, a reflection of your own tenderness, perhaps, that says, okay, maybe, maybe some other time, but not right now. You know, it can be a gentle thing. Self care in that sense, self kindness can be looking after your own needs. It can be treating yourself. It can be taking some time for yourself, whatever form it takes. It's just recognizing that I need to find a way of recharging myself, of filling my, up my own cup. Otherwise, there'll be nothing of me left with which to, to function in the world. So true, David. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, really good advice there and some nuggets. Um, and could you maybe leave our viewers and listeners with a, like a positive takeaway, like a little word of advice, perhaps? Uh, yeah, try, try to be kind best you can, but, but don't beat yourself up if you can't. You know, don't give yourself a hard time because we're all we're only human. And, and I'll say that honestly, even from my own perspective, you know, I write books about kindness. But I'm also only human. And despite my best efforts, I don't always manage. And, and I think once we set out in the path to say, I'm going to be kind, it's really healthy. We then counter that by criticizing ourselves when we don't feel that we've made, we've, we've lived up to the, the, you know, the guidelines we set ourselves. If I could share a, just a, a real example. So I was in the middle of writing my, my new book, The Joy of Actually Giving a Fuck. It's all about kindness. And you would think that I, people sometimes say, hey, David's the king of kindness. Yeah, it's big pressure that you put on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I'm quick to point out, I might be the king of writing about kindness, <laughs> but I'm human. I'm in awe of yeah. the people on the front line of things who are really there every day 
yeah. caring for people, being kind to people, parents looking after their children. I'm in awe of people who are literally doing these things every day. I, I quickly point out, I might be the, if I'm the king of anything, it's writing about kindness. I'm, I'm human. And here, here's a good example of writing the book. And one day I realized I had to get to the post office. It's about a mile from my house. I usually just walk down, but this time I was in a hurry and I had to take the car down. Uh, not climate friendly, but I really was. I had to get there and back. And, and when I drove back, drove around, I, I couldn't get parked. And usually you just drive around a couple of times and there's a space available. At the time, there's been a, there was a bit of an issue with parking and inconsiderate parking. My neighbours and I referred to it in a, where I live because there's a few Airbnbs that have propped up and, and people just come and park and they have been parking in really not not the kindest way. And it's been taking up two and three spaces at a time for residents. And so it was always on my mind. And so here I was, I realised there was a space probably big enough for two and a half cars. And there was a car about to park in. And I thought, well, I'll just indicate and I'll go in next. And so uh, I was sitting there and the person reversed back and then took what seemed like an age. And then instead of parking up in one of the spaces, reversed right into the centre of what was two and a half, almost three spaces. And I went, oh my God, what are you doing? And, and I, I, I drove up and just to make a point, even though there was no way I could get my car out, it was a mini, mini Cooper, no way I could get the car in, just to make a point. Again, I'm just being human. And I, I indicated and I, I tried to do like a seven point turn, couldn't quite get in. Grudgingly, the person just moved their car forward a few feet. And then I made a few, several turns and got the car in. And I looked him up front and I could see his eye out the wingman and I went like, like that. You know, looking back, I cringe. And this is me writing about kindness. And it was only because it was on my mind about all this inconsiderate parking. And, and earlier that day, someone had literally parked in a car park that goes that way, that way and taking up three spaces. And I, so it was in my mind. And I looked at her like that. I wasn't being unkind. I was just going like that as if, say, come on, you know, I wasn't being aggressive. I'm not that kind of person at all. But I did go, you know, and then it, then it, it, that kind of, kind of like that. It's not the kind of thing you want to do if the person's six foot six, you know, but he wasn't six foot six. What happened next was a frail old man got out of the car. And it took him about three or four minutes to get himself and a walking stick out of the car. And I felt I wanted the ground to swallow up, swallow me up. I felt terrible. But you know why I felt so bad? Because I lost my dad quite just before I started writing the book. My dad had a brain tumor. And before my dad was diagnosed with a brain tumor, my dad lost his confidence in driving. And he used to do exactly that. He used to take a bit more space bigger a, a bigger space to turn he needed bigger spaces to park in because he'd lost his confidence he wasn't sure of himself and at that moment i felt like crying because all i could think of was my dad and how my dad would have done exactly the same as that elderly man he would have taken the middle of the space not because he's been inconsiderate but because he was he lost his confidence and, and it, it, it's maybe something else i could leave for your, your listeners is try not to be hard on people because you never know what people are dealing with in their life. You never know what people are going through. So in these moments, and I'm saying that as a human being who writes about kindness, is we, we're, all, we're all sometimes the person who judges people, yeah. but we're also sometimes the person on the other side who need a wee bit of comfort as well. And I've been the other side of that when, when my dad was struggling, when I almost caused a car accident because I was so in my head worrying about my dad and I was going to pick him up to take him to the hospital. And I nearly caused an accident and someone was kind to me. When I almost ran my foot in the brakes and he went, it's okay, on you go. And it's as if the person sensed that I was having a hard time. So we've all been the other side. So maybe that's the most powerful thing I could leave for your listeners. Dr. David Hamilton, thank you so much for being my guest. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.